Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Socratic Club debate. The club was founded to provide a forum for the, the discussion of intellectual difficulties connected with religion, and in particular, Christianity. Our goal is to provide the OSU community with a venue for engaging philosophical debates. We also hope to maintain the Socratic Club's long-standing tradition of free dialogue and civility between people of all religious backgrounds. Tonight's debate will be separated into three sections. First, each speaker will present their opening remarks for 20 minutes. Next, each speaker will give, uh, be given up to eight or nine minutes to respond to the other speaker's opening statement. And then they'll be seated and asked questions of each other for 15 minutes total. And then lastly, uh, we'll have audience questions for about 45 minutes, and then their closing remarks. Tonight's debate is entitled, Do Atheists Have Faith? Christians and atheists both employ reason in infor informing their views. But Christians hold, um, hold some faith for their beliefs, while atheists claim not to have faith. Is it rational to use faith as a foundation for belief, and can atheists legitimately claim that their views are faith-free? Our speakers will offer differing points of view. Michael Gurney will argue that secularists and religious believers alike hold some sort of faith. Martin Irway will argue that secularists reject faith claims altogether. Our first speaker tonight is Michael Gurney. Mr. Gurney is a professor of theology and ethics at Multnomah University in Portland. He served in the US Navy in the Naval Nuclear Power Program and the USS Truxton before earning his BA in theology. He holds an MA in philosophy of religion and ethics and is currently a PhD candidate in historical theology at Aberdeen University in Scotland. His academic interests focus on the historical interaction between philosophy, theology, science. Please join me in welcoming Michael Gurney. Good evening. Tonight, I will argue for the affirmative to the question, do atheists have faith? Before making my argument, allow me to explicate and clarify what my affirmative response to this question involves and its implications. For the sake of clarity and precision, throughout this argument, I will use the term secularist so as to broaden my argument to include not only those who specifically make a claim that God does not exist, but also include those who would likewise share the common conviction with atheists that religion and religious beliefs are not germane to knowledge and truth. A common assertion is sometimes made, and more often assumed, that in intellectual disputes between secularists and religious believers, that religious belief is primarily, if not exclusively, a matter of faith and therefore presumed to be devoid of any cognitive content. Given such a presumption, the secularist often contends that the religious belief to be viewed, is that, is that fade now? Yeah. Keep it up here, I guess. You might take a bite out of it. No dinner time. Okay. Uh, where was I? All right. Uh, a common assertion is sometimes made, and more often assumed, that in intellectual disputes between secularist and religious believers, that religious belief is primarily, if not exclusively, a matter of faith, and therefore presumed to be devoid of any cognitive content. Given such a presumption, the secularist often contends that religious belief is to be viewed as rationally inferior to the intellectual conviction of the secularist, and thus in any intellectual dispute, the secularist position holds the rational high ground. This assumption hinges on what one takes faith to be. In this debate, I will argue that the oft-assumed conception of faith is in fact faulty and misleading, especially has a distinguishing characteristic between religious believers and secularists. Consequently, I will argue that faith, or more precisely, what I would call a generic faith, is not a unique cognitive disposition held by religious believers only, but is in fact likewise possessed and manifested by those of no overt religious orientation, including those identified as secularists. If my argument proves successful, then this has significant ramifications for discourse between religious believers and seculars. Allow me to explain. It is commonly assumed that in contrast to the religious believer's intellectual commitments that rely heavily on faith, the secular's commitment to reason admits no reliance on faith. Thus, in any cognitive contest between religion and secularism, without compelling intellectual reasons on the part of the proponent of religious belief, the secular view is said to rationally prevail. As a consequence, religious belief in such disputes always has the burden of proof. Unless I have rationally compelling reasons for religious belief, secularism wins by default. 
But if my analysis and ensuing argument is correct, then both secularists and religious believers have faith commitments. This would then entail that both religious believers and secularists equally bear the burden of providing empirical and rational argument to corroborate their ideological commitments. For the secularist, I take their ideological commitments to be profoundly shaped by philosophical naturalism. So what is philosophical naturalism? First, I would suggest that naturalism is a metaphysical and epistemological thesis that the physical universe, which is coextensive with reality, can be sufficiently described and accounted for in reference to material and natural laws, namely the laws of chemistry and physics. As Carl Sagan so succinctly stated, quote, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be, end of quote. Atheist philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell gives us a more robust description that addresses some of the implications of naturalism, especially in regards to humanity. Quote, that man is the product of causes that had no prevision of the end they were achieving. That his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves, his beliefs, are but the outcome of an accidental collocations of atoms. That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspirations, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast depth of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. End of quote. Such a naturalist perspective has prompted philosopher John Searle, himself a naturalist, to declare, quote, there is exactly one overriding question in contemporary philosophy. How do we fit in? How can we square this self-conception of ourselves as mindful, meaning-creating, free, rational agents with a universe that consists entirely of mindless, meaningless, unfree, non-rational, brute physical particles?" End of quote. Searle's questions are quite revealing. Based on this description of naturalism, my thesis is that such an account of reality and our place in that reality is itself dependent on a number of faith commitments. Critical to my argument is, of course, my definition of faith. The key here is not to utilize a definition of faith that begs the question in favor of my conclusion. So after consulting a number of English dictionaries, including the Oxford English Dictionary, let me propose a definition of faith that I think is consistent with the common English usage and helpful for purposes in this debate. I'm defining faith as relying on what or who you have reason to believe is trustworthy. I'll say it again. Relying on what or whom you have reason to believe is trustworthy. I will refer to this definition as generic faith, as it makes no specific reference to what or whom one places their faith in, including God or other explicit authorities or sources. Consequently, this definition and conception of faith easily accommodates, as I hope to show, the secularist perspective in that secularists, like religious believers, draw their beliefs and convictions from sources, intellectual and otherwise, that they consider trustworthy. Now, at this point, there may be some from the religious side of the issue who think that my generic conception of faith uh, evacuates all relevant concerns involving benefit and virtue. I'll defer, I'll defer this concern to my concluding argument. Once again, here's my thesis. Whether one is a theist or a naturalist, or anyone else for that matter, one's intellectual viewpoints are dependent on significant faith commitments, whether assumed or acknowledged. Now, what are the faith commitments of naturalism? For purposes of brevity and clarity, I will address three specific faith commitments that coincide with three major foci of philosophical analysis, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. First, in regards to metaphysics, the secular's commitment to naturalism relies on the metaphysical thesis that reality is comprehensively and sufficiently described and explained in reference to matter, which operates in complete dependence upon physical laws. Secondly, that coinciding with metaphysical materialism is an epistemological commitment to strong versions of empiricism, namely scientism of some degree. Third, in conjunction with metaphysical materialism and epistemological scientism, is a commitment to ethical naturalism. Now, once again, my point here is that these three intellectual assumptions that profoundly shape the secularist perspective are indeed faith commitments. This is not to say that some secularists, particularly philosophers, 
have not reflected upon and even argued for metaphysical materialism, epistemological scientism, and ethical naturalism. In fact, a number of secularists have and do, as have theists in their faith in intellectual commitments. <coughs> Rather, the issue before us is this, whether such intellectual commitments are of such a rationally and evidentially compelling nature that no element of generic faith as previously defined is required. Unless this is the case, that naturalism enjoys such strong and, ras and, or strong and decisive rational and empirical support that no faith be required, then the nationalist secularist viewpoint does not occupy a privileged position in terms of rational superiority. And such a viewpoint, like that theism, can and needs to be subjected to rational scrutiny. First, let's look at metaphysical materialism. If metaphysical materialism is true, has an exhaustive description of reality, then the secular perspective is not only reasonable, but must be true with regards to the question of God's existence, or more precisely, God's non-existence, unless one substantially revises their conception of God. But is such a metaphysical commitment true and demonstrable? Let me suggest that upon brief reflection, metaphysical materialism is not only not self-evident as a description of reality, but further that many of our experiences are difficult to reconcile with such an assumption. <clears throat> Let me offer a thought experiment to illustrate the difficulties for metaphysical materialism. Suppose we have a student taking a philosophy class. I think some of you probably relate to this. And the professor's just put on the board the widely used syllogism, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, conclusion, Socrates is mortal. Now, we want to consider what conditions are necessary in order for that individual to rationally think about the syllogism. Obviously, one must perceive the writing on the board, but beyond perception, what must occur in what we would describe as thinking? The materialist understand, understanding relies on what is called physicalism, which attempts to explain our mental life as being sufficiently described in physical terms. That is, one's mental activities can be reduced to and or explained by neurophysiological events governed by the laws of chemistry and physics. So on this account, one's thoughts concerning the syllogism are to be explained by or reduced to the correlated brain states. There are quite sophisticated theories that attempt to provide a sufficient physical account for such an act. But I would contend that physicalism in its various versions cannot adequately explain how or why our student comes to either accept or reject the argument by way of rationality. It seems to me that there are several aspects involved in the act of thinking that require explanation that are beyond materialism's explanatory power. For sake of brevity, I will just focus on four. One, mental states are characterized by intentional relations to the external world and seem to cause other mental states. Two, the existence of abstract propositions and laws of logic. Three, the existence of an enduring self who can reason through an argument from initial premise to conclusion, and who plays a relevant role in either accepting or rejecting that argument. And four, the reasoning process itself is a reliable, though not infallible, means of discovering truth about the world. I would contend that explaining the state of affair on a strictly material grounds is far from self-evident. This naturally, pardon the pun, leads us to the naturalist epistemological commitment